Hi, um, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I started this investigation to sustainability about 23 years ago when I was a fisherman up in Alaska, and we caught um, mackerel and sunfish in our net, and uh, it disturbed me very much. And I just read The Ends of the Earth by Isaac Asimov, and I quickly realized that we were, in fact, infecting the climate with our behavior. Um, so I started to look into nutrient cycling in agriculture, and um, thinking about the food system that wasn't based on getting our ammonia from a fossilized source, basically. So my concern, of course, was, um, was that, and I quickly realized that our food system was messed up and we needed to localize the system, and what did that mean? And I started to investigate methane gas production. Along those lines, about seven years ago, I came across this idea of, of biochar. Um, and so I, I, I was reading uh, E.F. Schumacher and uh, Buckminster Fuller and kind of following down those lines of um, integrated systems. And when I came across the idea of biochar, I saw it as this potential uh, unifier, right? That it was, David mentioned earlier, you know, air, water, uh, earth, and fire. And we've really eliminated fire from the ecosystem and it's caused a lot of problems. Um, my background's in forestry and agriculture, and you know, we, we all know that there's, there's massive fuel loads in the forest. Um, we now have crown fires instead of cold, low-burning fires. Um, it's just, it's, it's a very destructive practice that we, we think we, we can um, control and manipulate nature in, instead of allowing it to be, right? So I kind of come in and out of being a scientist and being kind of esoteric, and you know, I kind of give, I've kind of given up on trying to understand nature, but I'm more interested in, in mimicry, right? And um, so we have this issue, these issues in agriculture and in the rural sector. Um, we need to localize our economies. We need to make our land uh, more, more uh, available to produce food at, at all levels. And um, biochar has, has, has a role in that, in my opinion. Um, so I, we have a, a, there's been two times um, the billion ton study, I don't know if you've heard of it, we have tremendous amounts of, of biomass rotting in the ecosystem. I've worked for uh, about a period of five years as a, as a biomass energy director for a couple of timber companies, and I went out and did a quick assay of our, our material that was just rotting, and we had about 6,000 tons at any given time just rotting in the log yard. Um, my goal was to take that underutilized material make energy with it, and harvest carbon in the process. Now, if I do that in a sound manner, with a certain amount of control, I can man actually manipulate that material based on temperature and feedstock and residence time. Um, it's an exothermic reaction. Um, it, it, the, the material that I yield out of that has these components. Those components might vary depending upon those, those things that I mentioned earlier. It, it's gonna, we'll have higher ash if we have grasses and manures. We have a much higher carbon if I have white wood as opposed to bark. So it's, it's a very nuanced material. The, the idea of this, it, it, is a, it is a potential cool project of bioenergy, but the actual idea of it comes from soil science. It comes from this terra preta, the Indio. Um, in 1962, a, a soil scientist by the name of William Sombrecht went down to the Amazon because he had heard of these stories of these very fertile soils. What he in fact found was perhaps some of the most fertile soil in the world. Um, you have the, the parent soil, which is this oxalic clay, and then you have the terra mulata, which is kind of inside of that, and then you have the terra preta. Which, these are literally in, in circles out, out in the Amazon. Um, the, 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 the terra preta de indio um, is in the, in the center. They were, you know, David went into it earlier. They were carbonizing their waste um, in these slow, cold fires. Uh, there's causeways down there that, that was identified that go between these villages. There was millions of people, perhaps, that were living at that time in the Amazon based on these soils. Um, this is a picture that a friend of mine, Christoph Steiner, took. You can see the difference in the growth between those two soils. You have the parent soil on one side and the, the uh, terra preta on the other. Um, so, you know, there's kind of this thing with biochar when you first come across it, that it's going to be this great black panacea that's going to save the world, right? And it's, it's not that. It's a wedge and it's a potential. But it has tremendous um, possibilities that I think deserve investigation and deserve to figure out how this fits into the system. And it's got to be a whole system. It's got to be integrated for it to work, right? 
Um, so the, the methods of production vary. You have slow pyrolysis, which there's kind of, you think about the old Missouri kiln and the kind of the off-gassing of, of that. It's not really very clean. You can do slow pyrolysis now in a much cleaner manner where you, you just take those gases and you loop them back into the system and you actually start to drive the process under high, high amount of control. There's fast pyrolysis, which is generally, um, doesn't yield a whole lot of carbon, but uh, bio oil. My personal bent is I'm a little dubious about that whole deal. Um, I, there's a kind of a midway to, and then there's gasification. And gasification, you can actually make a gas that so you can run an internal combustion motor. I do gasification, slow pyrolysis in my uh, work. So the general way that this works is you have a, a load of, of excess biomass. It can, it, this is, of course, industrial. It can go through these, these processes to screen and dry. The upshot is if you put three tons of biomass into a pyrolytic system, your yield is one ton of biochar, the inherent energy to drive the process, and a megawatt of thermal drive. If you put it into a gasification process, you end up harvesting about 6.3 megawatts of thermal drive and about one ton of biochar for every eight tons of dry biomass going into the process. Uh, it's, it's being done now. There's, gasification has been going on for about 150 years at uh, relatively industrial scales. Um, and it's, it's a very scalable uh, process. You can do it on farm scales, you can do it on industrial scales. And then, of course, there's the stoves. And, and these stoves that you can make, these pyrolytic stoves in the developing countries are, that's five minutes, <laughs> okay, are, are very, um, can, can, can help humans, right? This is, this is emphysema is killing women and children around the world. They can take these, these stoves, take the carbon, put them into their poor soils, build up the fertility of the soils, increase net primary productivity, um, you know, and also use it to clean their water and all this other. So I guess that's my five minutes.